Today we're finishing up our series on the seven deadly sins. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you've been doing this with your small group or with your mentor or even with your family, we've been covering these seven sins. And today we're going to finish up with the final deadly sin of sloth. And here's the big idea. This is why we've saved this one for the very end. The seven deadly sins is not a list to keep us from getting the most out of life. The opposite is actually true. And the sin of sloth proves it. If God was just a cosmic killjoy keeping us from having fun, then you'd probably expect something else on this list. But I love that we're talking about sloth because you're going to see that sloth is that sin that keeps us from really enjoying life. Now, let's start with the definition like we've done every week so far. Sloth is a reluctance to work or make an effort, also known as laziness. Also, sloth is a slow-moving tropical American mammal that hangs upside down from trees. When we look at the picture of that little guy, you say, what could possibly be so wrong with sloth? Well, here's the biblical answer to that. Sloth is giving up on life and relationships. It looks like laziness, but in reality, it's apathy. I love how author Dorothy Sayers puts it. It is the sin which believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, loves nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and only remains alive because there is nothing it would die for. That is sloth. And here's why Jesus thinks it's a problem. He says in John 10.10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give people a rich and satisfying life. Here's the sad reality. Today, so many people, especially young people, but really people of all ages, they miss out on what Jesus came to give us. This is why the deadly sins are so deadly, because they keep us from this passage. They keep us from Christ's purpose. Christ came to conquer sin so that we can really enjoy life. And some of you might be out there right now saying, I've kind of given up on it. I'm apathetic. I'm not engaged in the world anymore. I've withdrawn. I've shrunk back. And Jesus would say, I can change that for you. See, the picture of genuine faith is not of monks hidden away in their monasteries, but rather of men and women engaged in their world. We see this in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11. It lists out guys like Noah who built a boat and Abraham who left his home and Moses who fought for his people. And then the author goes on in verse 32 and he says, How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. And he goes on, he says, They shut the mouths of lions and quenched the flames of fire and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Now, there's nothing wrong with monks, but history and the Bible is replete with men and women of faith who stood up and did something. They engaged in their world. They made a difference, which means they did not suffer from the sin of sloth. And that's the lesson for us today. The antidote to sloth, to apathy, is to purposefully engage in the world. And the good news is the payoff is joy. This is what the author of Hebrews talks about in chapter 12, where he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, he's talking about that faith hall of fame list in chapter 11. He says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. And then he says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, and then you won't become weary and give up. Focus in on this part right here. Because of the joy awaiting Jesus, he endured the cross. 
Jesus passionately and purposefully engaged in the world. He even suffered in the world. And he did that because of joy. He recognized that putting the effort forward would be worth it because he understood what was awaiting him at the end of it and what was awaiting us as well. And this is the key for anyone who feels apathetic right now. Look at the example of Christ. Think of all the hostility that he endured from sinful people. And then you won't become slothful. You won't become weary and give up. Author Graham Tomlin says the opposite of love is not hatred, it's indifference. If indifference is at the heart of sloth, then sloth is the enemy of love, which makes it the enemy of the best thing there is, the heart of God, the heart that beats at the center of the universe. Remember what we said at the outset of this series. The seven deadly sins are bad habits that destroy our ability to love God, to love others, and to love ourselves. This is why these seven deadly sins were such a big problem. And not just these seven, but every sin that entangles us and keeps us from engaging in the world and making a difference because of the power and the love of Jesus Christ. So now use those questions down below with your small group, with your family, with your mentor to talk about this final deadly sin. And I want to encourage you to check out our other series and topics at PursueGod.org. It's all there to help empower you to have meaningful conversations with people in your world as you pursue God together. So I hope you've enjoyed this series and I hope you'll check out some of our other series at PursueGod.org.